Welcome to Orioles on the Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phil and, and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's episode, we're going to take questions from our listeners. We're going to cover the majors and the minors in this special mailbag episode. And with that, I'm going to dive right into this question from Ben. When does John Means return? And who is off the rotation and roster when he returns? I'm going to start with Bob. Well, I just happen to have my uh, globe here that tells the future. Um, I think, well, he'll be back within 30 days of his rehab starts. So by the end of April, he'll be back. I would imagine he takes Cole Irvin's spot in the rotation. And I would imagine that I would keep Cole Irvin around. He's out of options. I think he can be really solid as a multi-inning reliever, long man, if you need someone, if the starter can't give you too much length which leaves Jonathan Heasley and Mike Bauman as the options to uh, kick to the curb here. And Heasley has an option. Bauman doesn't. I know Bauman has struggled mightily to start this year, but I think if Heasley's not replaced before Means comes around town, then uh, I would say Bauman. But the easy answer is Jonathan Heasley. Well, my first question was <clears throat> Ciano Perez. When is he coming back first? And would that be before John Means, which hopefully it, it's before John Means comes back. But I imagine it's around the same time. So, yeah, I went that I said, assuming Perez is back first and off the IL, Heasley goes down and then Means comes back. Either way, it doesn't matter who comes back first or second. Heasley goes down because he has the option. And then you're looking at guys who don't have options and some guys who do have options that I'm sure some fans would like to see just go down to Norfolk so they don't have to deal with them anymore but they're pitching very well uh so this is when i think when it does get tough i agree i, th I think Irvin doesn't have the option so you can't send him down to norfolk he's not going to get three waivers obviously <clears throat> so if Heasley's down means comes back i know aiken has the option but he's been he had a great spring he looks really good i hate to say I it. Know. <laughs> i know i kept telling you i said it three four times in a row you look at the numbers last year when he was healthy, they were actually really, really good um, and trending in the right direction from the year before, even when he was okay. Like I, you got to keep Aiken. I think it's Bauman. Like I think it's, it's gotta be Aiken just had, a, he had a great spring. He's off to a strong start this year. I think you can move on from Michael Bauman, to be honest. And it's, it's tough. And I'm not just saying this because he just had that meltdown. Like who else is it going to be? I mean, Bauman's going to be 29 years old this year. He's not a young prospect anymore. He's not going to slip through waivers, but I do think he is replaceable. Like Albert Suarez looked really good. He had what six shutout innings the other day. You can bring up Albert Suarez. He's got swing and miss stuff to bring in this bullpen. You can make a trade. Uh, you can find another guy off waivers. You can make a small time trade to get another guy to bring in. Like you can replace Michael Bauman. I feel like his production like, is Brian Baker really that much worse? <laughs> I mean, I know we don't want Brian Baker yeah. back in the bullpen, but he's got an option. Is he that much worse than Michael Bauman? Juanis and Charles yeah. is there. Keegan Gillis mm -hmm. comes in with the bases loaded and double A billion strikes out three in a row. Like there's there's options. Yeah, I agree. So sorry, Mike, but love that no hitter in Bowie. We'll always have that. But it's just he's he's not a young guy anymore. He's getting old. He's about to be 30 soon. Like I I think he is who he is. He can be there's a role for him somewhere in the majors, but I, I think his time is about up here in Baltimore. Yeah, I agree. I think that CNL Perez's timeline is important to keep in mind because I think Bauman will get a little bit of a lease because he doesn't have options. And because there were times last year, he was really effective. So Heasley, I, I feel bad for Heasley because I almost feel like he's in that spot where no matter how well he pitches in the next week or two, he's going to go down because he has options left. Now, the good news is we could see him back. So I would say for right now that in some order, Perez comes back. He goes into the back into the bullpen. Means rejoins the rotation. Irvin goes to the bullpen. And then at that point, I think Bauman becomes vulnerable. I'll point this out with Bauman. I was watching Saturday's game, and the one thing that really jumped out at me was that he really did not seem to be trusting his fastball at all. There were a lot of spots that I caught, thought he could have thrown that pitch in that he didn't. And the bat that I look at is Edward Alvarez is up. And here's your pitch sequence. 
knuckle curve ball, slider, knuckle curve, knuckle curve, slider, knuckle curve. He ends up walking him. And at that point, the tying run comes in. Bauman did not throw a single fastball in that at bat. And that's just not something I'm used to seeing from him. And it is a little bit alarming. I hope that over the next couple of weeks, he can figure it out. But right now, something just seems off with him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the guy that can throw 98 miles per hour. He's got to go to that unless he just does not trust it uh, to command it whatsoever. Well, he wasn't really commanding the other pitches either. So, yeah, that was tough to see. But here's a question from, I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> um, I love to know how to pronounce it. Is this a name? Is it a nickname? Does anyone have any uh Helpful hints. E O J S Mata. That's <laughs> yeah. Spelling. Yeah. Oh yeah. That could be it. E O E O J. A great commenter. Great patron in the Discord group. I just I've read it all the time. I just have never said it out loud until this second. <laughs> um, e O J S Mata says, "Is it possible that we see Connor Norby be the first call up with Jackson and Kobe not looking quite?" comfortable defensively just yet does Norby's steadiness give him a small advantage injuries withstanding of course start with Zach there is a little bit of advantage that Norby has and that's experience he was at AAA to end the 2022 season he was there all of last year and I've made the argument repeatedly on the show that I think if you look across the board his 2023 season was better than his 2022 season which says a lot because he was great in 2022 what I'm curious to see is how high of a bar are the Orioles setting for his right field defense. Because if that bar is kind of high, then I could see him down in Norfolk for a little while. But if they're just putting him in right field so they can give Jackson Holiday as many innings at second base as possible, but they really don't plan to play him much there in the majors, then I think it is possible you could see Norby ahead of one of those two guys because of the experience level and because of the fact that Right now, second base is not a position where the Orioles are getting a lot of production. So right-handed hitter, has a lot of time at AAA, could fill a real need for you. So I still feel like Mayo or Holiday get there first, just based on the Orioles' habits, where if they introduce a new position with a player, they're going to want that player to play out there for a while. And in Norby's case, that's right field. But if they're not really too concerned about his defense out there, then I think it's possible you could see him in the majors before one of those other two players. It's tough. And it's so fresh. I know it's frustrating to think about on our end. And it's frustrating for fans who watch him play in Norfolk for the last two years and ask, where does he fit in? But so I know it's got to be extremely frustrating for him. I mean, he's, he's let those frustrations come out publicly even last year, but I just don't see it. And I think that is a good point that Zach just brought up. And it is a good question that I have. Is he playing? Cause he's played like all but one or two games. He's played pretty much every game in Norfolk in either left or right field. So is it because they're making sure holiday can play second base every night? And then you've got guys like Errol Robinson and Nick Maton filling out the rest of the infield. But is it because they want holiday at second base every night? Or is it because, Hey, you've got a chance to come up to the big leagues, but <clears throat> show us you can play in the outfield. I don't know. I'm going to assume that it's, we need to give Jackson holiday as much run at second base as possible because he's coming up. So I, you know, I think Norby, a lot of people, I don't want to say a lot of people. I think there are some people who don't realize just how good of a prospect he is because he gets overshadowed so much. The kid is legit. And I don't think we've ever said anything like, negative about Connor Norby's play. Like he's not that good of a prospect. We're all huge fans of Norby. This hitterish prospect coming out of the draft is a power hitter as well, which I did not see coming when they drafted him out of ECU. It is frustrating. And part of me is just like, I don't just want to just trade him just to trade him because he's completely blocked. But at the same time, I do think he is completely blocked because Holiday's going to come up. He has to come up soon. Mayo could force the issue at some point this year. Like, are you going to bring up Connor Norby as the 26th man to replace Tony Kemp? Uh, but is this organization going to be comfortable with giving a rookie sparing at bats in the major leagues? I don't know. I don't think they would be. So I just, 
I just think he is completely, if there is a path for him, I don't see it. If someone else sees it, I'd love to hear like what that path could be, but I just don't see any path. Like there's blocked and then there's Connor Norby. Like he is on a whole nother level of being completely blocked from this roster. I think. Yeah, it is super tough. Like I want to try to figure out a way and then it's like, well, wouldn't you just bring up Kerset or wouldn't you just bring up Mayo or Holiday or even Stowers at this point? But I guess short term, like, could he come up and be a temporary placeholder against if we have another string of lefties coming up? He's a guy that you could treat like Taron Vavra when he was brought up. Like, you don't need to play him every day. Like, if you bring up these other guys, uh, Kerstad, Mayo, Holiday, like, would you be comfortable starting him in right field slash second base slash DH against lefties just to give that boost against lefties after if they continue to struggle like this against them? But that's like the only way I could see it, unfortunately. Or injuries, you know, injuries would be one way for sure he could finally get a chance and he does deserve a chance. So, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Um, and I, I thought about that too. You could bring him up as like a bridge option or get, get him some run now if you want him to, but would the organization send him back down? Like what if he hits? What if he does play really well? Like how can you send him back down? And then you can't have holiday and Norby and Mayo is going to force his way. Mayo is over here. Baseball America just said this kid's putting up legitimate 80 grade power display down in Norfolk right now. He's hitting the ball so hard and at such good launch angles. I don't, care about the defense right now that bat has got to find a way to the major leagues at some point this year it's you say you want to say all play out which it normally does but in this situation i I do think it is kind of uh it's more difficult but we'll see how this the next couple weeks play out i guess um we'll go to the next question here from a fed and all these come from our uh discord how have mayo and holiday looked defensively so far (laughs) looking solely at box scores it seems errors in the first few days have showed have slowed but how have they have they been getting many chances in the field? Do they look comfortable on their routine plays? Any athletic web gyms? I kind of said my piece on both these guys, especially Holiday. What have you guys seen from them this season so far? Honestly, yeah, there's been some issues, especially that that first weekend really was a lot of errors, mostly throwing. I've honestly seen Kobe Mayo. Obviously, he's not throwing the ball the way. I'm sure he would want to right now, but I've seen him make some pretty good plays charging in made some athletic plays. Like I'm I'm still not worried about it. I think he's going to be an average third baseman at least long-term and probably this year, not a, not a worry for me. And obviously it was spring training fluff, but I don't think guys are like, um, I forget the third base coach for the Orioles and the infield coordinator, but I don't think he's blowing smoke when he was saying that stuff. So I think Mayo will be fine. And like you said, that bat, oh, my God, he's hitting 112. (laughs) Like, he's just crushing baseballs right now. And it's funny. He probably has, like, one of the lowest OPSs uh, out of that top five, at least. Uh, But he's still playing incredible. Uh, And Holiday, I think he looks perfectly fine at second base. Honestly, I haven't seen anything to suggest otherwise. I know one of the errors that he was involved with was, like, a perfect – soft throw to curse that and he just flat dropped it um (laughs) yeah so defensively i think they're making the routine i think they're making better than routine plays you know you just gotta make the throws a little more bit more accurate yeah i agree i don't think that anything we've seen from them so far is any more than early season jitters and to go to your point, Bob, what Tony Mandolino said about Mayo and spring training spoke volumes to me because if the throwing motion was an issue, and it sounds like the Orioles did think it was an issue for Mayo, he's done a lot to rectify that since the end of last season. And that progress matters a lot more than a defensive slump at the beginning of the year. So give it a little bit of time. I think things are going to even out and he's going to be fine. The same with Holiday at second base. Now, I do think the adjustment curve with Holiday is going to be a little bit different because he doesn't have as much time at second base as Mayo has at third. But we're talking about someone who last year played what I think could be described at worst as a capable shortstop. And most nights, a very good shortstop. So if he can do that over the course of a full season, he's going to make an easy adjustment to second base. So 
Both of them may be off to a little bit of a rocky start defensively, but I'm not worried about it at all long term. Yeah. I think one of Mayo's errors, he slipped. Like he just slipped on the dirt a little bit. That was like opening night. I think he did have that one play, like Bob mentioned, that he came charging in on it, made a great throw over at first base. Holiday's got at least one or two diving plays. I think over at second base, he's shown off the range. He's shown off the instinct. It's yeah. I mean, the bar I imagine is very high with these guys defensively, just based on past prospects and past discussions as well with this organization. Like, of course they're not perfect, but I mean, you just look at these guys, the bat, it's the bats for me. They make you say they're, they're capable enough. I think at, at this level where you can bring them up and they'll learn on the fly. I yeah, so. I was going to say, it's not like we haven't seen these kids come up. Gunnar Henderson, look, in the beginning yeah. of last year when he's playing third base, he was missing some routine balls. He was throwing balls away. And obviously we mentioned the ball he threw away in Pittsburgh. That's a little bit different. He was trying to make an amazing play there. But he's become one of the best defensive shortstops in the game probably at this point. I mean, you saw him improve during the season defensively as well as offensively. So it's not like these guys couldn't come up. And you you just teach them on the fly, and hopefully they don't cost you anything in the meantime. But these guys are going to be really good defensively, so I agree. Yeah. Tim DeJean doesn't raise no wimps. He raised these kids right. They're going to be perfectly fine defensively. <laughs> Shout out Tim DeJean. We'll go back to the majors now. Uh, and this question from the bird is the word. The offense has struggled since the first two Angels games. What's the answer why do we struggle so much against left-handed pitching? We touched on this a little bit in our episode earlier this week about the majors, but I think this is an opportunity to maybe dive a little bit deeper into some of the struggles. And I'll start with Nick here. I Like I said earlier, I think it's just the guys you're counting on to step up and hit well against lefties to start this season are just cold to start the year, and that's really unfortunate. Uh, so really just unfortunate timing. It then some like major indictment against this roster. And the idea that they can't hit lefties. And I'll pull this up. I actually pulled this up from an article <clears throat> written on Camden Chat, I think like a couple of days ago. I don't know when exactly it was. And I did not jot down the title. So shout out to Camden Chat because I know they use a lot of our tweets and stuff and everything. Uh, but I don't remember the name of the article or who wrote it. I messed up there. My apologies. But in this article, they noted that last year as a team, the Orioles hit 260 with a 334 on base percentage and a 764 OPS against lefties. That was actually better than what they did against righties, which was a 254 average, a 316 on base percentage, and a 733 OPS against righties. And it's virtually the same team was their point, one of the points that they made in that article. So I just think it's, again, just unfortunate timing. This was their plan. I can't fault the Orioles plan and how they stacked this roster to begin the year, knowing they were going to go up against a gauntlet of lefties. And just unfortunately the bats couldn't produce for them in this two week sample. Yeah, I completely agree with that. First, the guys that have done well, Ryan Mountcastle off to a great start. He crushes lefties pretty much has continued to do so. And Jorge Mateo actually off to a really good start because he's almost playing exclusively against lefties and he's batting 308 with an 896 OPS, 13 at bats. So let's keep that in perspective. But, you know, if you look at the guys who have been performing well so far this year that don't get the starts against left handed pitching, that'd be Colton Kowser, who has a, an OPS just under 1100 in 11 at bats. You got Ryan O'Hearn with an OPS over 1,000 over his 18 at-bats. Those guys don't play against lefties. Guy Jordan Westberg, he's got a 597 OPS. He's your lefty guy. Ramon Arias obviously has one hit, a single on the year. He's a lefty guy. We know Austin Hayes batting 077 with a 249 OPS. James McCann, he had a game-winning hit, so can't complain too much, but he's a guy that plays a lot against lefties, 643 OPS. So, yeah, I think it's just the guys that – tend to get in against lefties are not performing against lefties to date. And the guys that have been performing so far this year have only been playing mostly against right-handed pitchers. So I think it's going to be fine in the long run. Like you said, we did better against lefties than we did against righties last year. And, and it's so few games that like one good game against lefty and all of a sudden those numbers are going to look more respectable. So let's give it a little more time. But we could also make a move or two. You know, Chris Stowers, they hit lefties well. 
Mayo and Norby, obviously, and I think Holiday will be fine against lefties as well. So when if and when those guys come up, they should help. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think that it's just been kind of an unfortunate timing where your hitters that are in there to face left-handed pitchers aren't hitting well. And really, the only guy that I think it speaks to a larger trend would be Cedric Mullins because Mullins has never hit lefties particularly well. But when Mullins is in a slump, which Mullins is in right now, he doesn't hit lefties at all. I think we know that. And then you add on to that Austin Hayes, Ramona Rios not hitting particularly well. James McCann, I think, has been kind of uneven to this point. I think it would be a fair way to describe it. But if just one of them could get going here in the coming weeks, that would help. Now, the Orioles are about to go through a stretch where they're going to face a lot of right-handed pitchers. So I think this is going to be an interesting test for this lineup to see, okay, if they come out and the bats break out against the Red Sox and the Brewers, does that mean that the issues are limited to left-handed pitching? Or is it just a coincidence? It's going to take a while to find out, but we'll have to wait and see. I think it's possible it could be a coincidence or it might be that they have to fine-tune that part of the roster a little bit. Uh, ben would like to know, or your status one on Twitter, if you – don't mind giving him a follow. You probably already do. If the three of you had a Lego build off like Gunner and Kowser do, who would win and what would you build? Any Lego experience here, Nick? Uh, not in like 25, 30 years. Uh, even my kids aren't really into Legos yet. So uh, I don't know. This one, This one's on you guys. Yeah, it's been a long time for me, too. I actually Googled this um, in preparation of this question. I learned that there is an architecture series, and the Guggenheim Museum looks kind of interesting, but it sells for $184 used on eBay, so I'm probably not getting around to that anytime soon. I've honestly never been a big Lego guy. My son got into it for a little bit. I had fun putting some of those things together, but there's big, that is not soothing for me. That gives me anxiety. I'm like, I, I lost the piece. Uh, oh man, my back hurts. I'm sitting here. Like, I just want to get this done. Like it's not, it, I know it's relaxing for some people. It wasn't for me. So I, I would put my money on Zach winning this competition, but I would build probably, I know those guys love their star Wars stuff. I'd probably go more Marvel over star Wars or like, the Statue of Liberty or, or something like that with one of those big sets. So uh, thanks for the, the attempt at a fun question there. Sorry we burst that bubble as a non-Lego people here. Um, <laughs> Billy of Bird Notice Podcast, shout out Billy. Uh, he asks, with expectations now a thing and with no manager ever really leaving on their own terms, at what point does Hyde end up on the hot seat? Bob? I think it's ridiculous that you would ever ask this question, Billy. You should be ashamed. <laughs> no, he, he was scared to ask it. But um, I think it could happen. I, I think um, probably not this year, no matter what, I would say. he's pro he, he ain't getting fired in uh, 2024 and probably not even in 2025. But I think if the Orioles severely disappoint expectations this year and he's like – arguing with the like he's just got to if he disagrees with the front office that's when he's on the hot seat if he's doing what they want and they're coming together and and it's a us failure for expectations then i think he gets an, another year and maybe if it, it happens again two years in a row then it's like okay we have to see what what's going on here but he's still a great clubhouse guy unless something changes and he's causing issues for whatever reason, which I just, I can't see it. He's so on board. And I think Elias is so on board with him. I just think it would take quite a bit for that to happen. Fully agree. I think it's a long, long ways off. Um, the two things that I would look at are, do the Orioles hit a point where they're just kind of stagnant? And I don't mean that they have seasons like last year where they win over hundred games and they keep losing in the playoffs. I'm talking maybe they win 90 games this year, 88 the year after that, 88 again the year after that. They just kind of hit this ground where they're a good team but not a great team, and the front office feels like they could be doing better. That's when I would start to look at it. But I think that Hyde is a long, long ways off from being on the hot seat at this point. And I think that Bob 
touched on was a really important point here, which is that the relationship with the front office is what's going to carry things. Not that he has to be a yes man, but if the front office feels like they have a reliable voice in the dugout and things just aren't working for whatever reason, I think that they're going to try to figure out what can we do better and what information can we give Brandon Hyde to make the team perform better before they start looking at switching out the manager spot. Yeah. I, I just love Hyde. I'm not going to lie. I've, I've said this for a while. I feel like he's a good mix of that. You don't see too often, a really good mix of <clears throat> I'm going to trust Sig and I'm going to like, I don't know how this is in the room when they're all meeting, but I feel like it's Sig and Elias and some others in that, that brain room are talking about things and Hyde's just like, just tell me what I need to do. Like some of that stuff just goes way over his head. At the end of the day, he's an old school baseball guy. But like he understands the advanced analytics and he respects all of that, but he can help translate that to the younger kids. He can help keep this clubhouse together. I think he's a really good mix of old and new school and just a guy. Clearly this team plays extremely hard for him. He will literally fight the other team for his guys, which I absolutely love. I, I, this team doesn't have to win the world series this year for us to look back and consider it a successful year either. Like, they just made it to the first round of the playoffs last year and got swept. Like there's still more that this team can do this year without winning the world series that I think fans it's going to take some time, obviously after that season ends, if it's not a world series win, but to look back and say, all right, that was a good year. We took a step forward. And I think it was on a recent episode of rates and barrels. It might've been the one with Britt Giroli was on recently with them, but I think they were talking about like an opposing executive because they had a discussion about uh, new ownership coming in. And I think it was Britt Giroli who had said that another ex an opposing executive made some comment about something to the effect of Elias hasn't been allowed to open up the wallet yet. And if he has that ability now, then the rest of the league is in trouble. And so, like, is that the case? We know Elias likes his guys. We know Elias likes to show off to the rest of the league and prove to the rest of the league we can scout and draft and develop our own guys. But if he's been handcuffed, and not been able to spend money, and now he is allowed to, and he wants to, and he does. Like this could be a lot of fun. This next off season could be the most fun we've had in years. And so, yeah, unless something just drastically goes wrong, I don't see him being on the hot seat for a couple of years. We'll wrap up here with this question from Matt W. Who is Davy Cruz, and why will he be this year's breakout pitcher? Start with Nick. That is a good question. I would love for Davy Cruz to be this year's breakout pitcher, uh, but I do think a lot has to go right for that to be for him to be a true breakout. He's twenty. I don't think he's twenty-one yet. He's twenty years he old. Just turned twenty. Wow. Um, he should be like twenty-four. Um, so just turned twenty. He's up in Aberdeen. The fastball velo is not going to blow you away. I think it's like a low nineties, but he's got four or five different pitches, decent ground ball numbers. Throughout his career up to this point, the thing <coughs> I think we just talked about this probably the last time I was on. It's been a couple weeks since I've been on, but the strikeout rate his first time through Del Marva was like 21%. And then the walk rate was 15%. That's not good. He repeated Del Marva and the strikeout rate went up to 25%, and the walk rate dropped to 12%. So that needs to be improved upon. But he's a lanky lefty. He pitched what two innings the other night and if I recall, I, it looks like he's bulked up a little bit. He's a little bit bigger. He doesn't like disappear when he turns sideways like he did these last couple of years. But like maybe he adds a few more ticks of velo now that he's a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. But he doesn't have the velo that Luis de Leon does. He doesn't have the secondaries that Luis de Leon does. But there's a good frame there, I think, with de Leon or with Davy Cruz. Like I've watched so much Davy Cruz these last two years i feel like he should be like 24 25 years old not someone who just turned 20 but yeah i was gonna say for a guy who we thought might be trapped at del marva he just turned 20 years old that's that's pretty crazy i did not realize he was quite that young either but he could definitely break i don't know if he would be the breakout he could definitely break out a little bit he's got some funkiness to his delivery you know he's got different pitches and he can mix it up. He doesn't have the pure stuff like Nick was saying that I don't think is going to wow you like a daily own, but 
I think the point stands though that what Matt is saying is like these international pitchers are coming up and eventually we're going to have the Samuel Basayo, but on the international pitching front. And uh, I'd love to know more about Georgeni Casimiri as well, who they just signed uh, randomly into a Delmarva. I don't know. I just love the name and it's always interesting to me when they sign these guys out of nowhere and then give them a role immediately. Um, but David Cruz, yeah, I like him a lot. I think he's probably long-term, probably a reliever. Maybe he could be the a version of Danny Kulum at some point in his career. I don't know, but yeah, I like the guy I'm rooting for him, but one of these international guys is going to break out. The big thing with Cruz is the command. And one of the things that really encouraged me last year was that after he got off to a bad start in terms of his walks, his numbers were okay otherwise, but his walk totals were not good early on last year. He was drastically better over the summer months. And just to put this into perspective, he threw 10 and two thirds innings in the month of April last year. He walked 12 batters in that span while striking out 15. You flash ahead over the next few months, 11 walks in 20 and two thirds innings in May. 12 walks in 22 innings in June, and then it came way down in July and August. Four walks in 18 innings pits, six walks in 20 innings in the month of August, and then September, five walks in five and two-thirds, but that's only over two outings at the very end of the season. You kind of write that off for the fluke that it is. He's making strides with his control, and if he's able to sustain that at Aberdeen, it's going to go a long way for him being successful. I agree with both of you that the stuff does not jump out at you the way it does with the Luis Day. We got you. You froze on us for like a solid 30 seconds there, probably. Oh. But yeah, the David Cruz and the second half of the season and not walking guys, uh, that is huge. And I feel like that's probably why they did bump him up to Aberdeen this year. What did he? I don't know what he did the other day. I think he had one walk and like two strikeouts in two innings. Yeah, this is a. He's so young. I did not realize he was just 20 years old. He was born in 2004, which is crazy. Um, yeah, these young guys, it's it'll be interesting to see who pops because it was Luis De Leon last year, and he popped in a major way. I think he's still severely underrated. We'll see who it is this year. And that does it for this week's episode. We will be back next week to talk about all things majors and minors for the Orioles. In the meantime, you can check us out on our many social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Threads, X, TikTok, and YouTube. Be sure to check out our Patreon community as well as our Substack newsletter. And you can have a sample of it all if you sign up for our Discord community. There is a link to that in our episode notes. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Birds, part of the Believe Podcast Network.